Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to uh, February's Social Care and Tackling Poverty Service Transformation Committee. Um, first item on the agenda is apologies for absence. Uh, apologies for absence from Councillor Meyer Baker. Thank you. Um, next item on the agenda is disclosures of personal and prejudicial interests. Okay, and then item three in the agenda is the minutes. Are we happy to approve the minutes from the previous meeting? Yeah, Hannah's happy to. Aren't you happy to second that? Okay, great. That's lovely. Okay, uh, on to the first item of the agenda proper then, which is item four, which is short breaks. And I believe, is it Judy who's. Helen? Yeah, okay, I'll hand over to you. Okay, I'm hoping everybody can hear me. Thank you very much. Um, so for those that don't know me, I'm Helen Williams. I'm Principal Officer for Young People and Adolescent Services in um, Child and Family. Um, and we've come today, I say we, I have colleagues with me, so Mark Gosney and Michelle Apthorpe. Um, so we've come today to discuss um, our developments around short breaks within child and family services. Um, so I'm just going to give a bit of a, an introduction based on the report that was prepared that I'm hoping people have had the opportunity to look at in advance. Um, and then we'll be happy to open up for any questions and Mark and Michelle will hopefully be able to support with answering some of those questions to give you as much of a clear picture as possible. Um, so I guess it just from my perspective um, and as an overview, we um, commission a number of short breaks provisions for young people with um, additional learning needs or disabilities who are open to our services. Um, these provisions are really crucial as part of care and support packages for young people. Um, it provides them with a bit of a break from their family situations, but equally their parents, carers, a really important opportunity to have some time, time apart and time to recuperate where care needs are quite significant. Um, it comes in a number of different forms in terms of short breaks. So we have um, the option of residential short breaks and so we have um, a provision through action for children called t laura they provide residential um opportunities for families um and we also have our family link process through them as well where young people can be matched with foster carers approved foster carers and can have some additional um respite overnight um through that through those means in addition to residential provisions, we also have some sort of day short breaks um, through other services such as buddies and pops. So that would be one to one or group work provisions where assessed needs can be met and young people have the opportunity to be within the community and integrate within um, activities, which is really important. And, and we feel very passionate that all of our young people should have those opportunities. Within child and family itself, we have some support through our Flexi Home team um, where that um, the short breaks, breaks can be provided when staff are matched with young people and they're able to undertake one to one work um, with them as well to continually give families um, some support. A number of our families like the opportunity of having a bit of flexibility around that support um, so the direct payments can be utilized for that purpose as well and it just enables families to have support at a time that suits them as opposed to a time that is um, structured because of when activities are taking place so what we are identifying we know that short breaks are crucial but what we are identifying is that for the provisions that we commission there are sometimes waiting lists to access we the the demand is just not able to be met as it currently stands so um mark and his team have been undertaking a review of this of our short breaks offer and uh, and the support that's in place for young people with additional learning needs um the idea being that we understand what that demand looks like, we understand what is currently being commissioned and to enable us to have the opportunity to think about is that enough? Do we need to be doing um, things slightly differently in order to support our families? Um, so I guess from my perspective, just to finish off before we open up to, to um, questions. We really value um, 
having providers that are able to support us with this area of work. We recognise that it is really challenging for our families day in, day out when they are undertaking such significant care um, uh, commitments for the young people and children that are living with them. Um, it is really important to us that we get that offer right. So this review has given us the opportunity not just to hear from um, our commissioned services, but equally and most importantly, to understand what our families and children and young people are telling us that they need and is really um, necessary for them to stay together. Um, because ultimately, without that provision, the, the concern is that we may end up being in a position where families just don't feel that it is sustainable for children to remain within their care. So I don't know whether there's anything Mark or Michelle want to add before we open up to questions, but otherwise we'd be more than happy um, to take any questions um, that anybody has. That's great. Um, that's great, Helen. Thanks very much, very much for that. Um, Alan, any questions? Nothing that draws off the top of my head, but uh, I mean, I just, um, I mean, the work that you do is absolutely terrific, I'm sure, especially for the, uh, for disabled people. I mean, having partly been involved as a school teacher, of course, uh, very familiar with, with that. I was just wondering, sort of, sort of, where do you get the funding from? Do you get funding from external uh, organisations or is it a charity? Just, just. Just thinking in terms of you mentioned the kind of 138 active direct payments in place for, for families. I was just wondering where that sort of money sort of comes from. Yeah. Thank you, Hazard. Yeah, yeah. So there's a number of funding streams in terms of this provision. So obviously there's core council funding. Um, there is also Welsh government funding as well. Um, a number of our providers who we fund will sort of utilise that to look to part funds, so big lottery, et, et cetera. But, you know, as we know, the economic climate is difficult um, and we are looking at how we can kind of make it as efficient as possible. So we are looking at things like direct payments and things like that and how we can utilise what current funding we have to you know the best possible and being more innovative with our approaches to try to to uh, you know to improve the services you know within decreasing budget, which is always a always a difficult uh, partnership. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Alan. Um, any other other members got any questions? I've got a few, but um, uh, Councillor O'Connor. Hi there. Um, it's a great idea. I'm just wondering, um, firstly, is there a cap on the amount of short breaks that one family uh, may be entitled to or have? And um, what's the, the waiting times for a short break if somebody was in desperate need of one? I guess that's a, a question that has a, a, a different set of answers. So each family, each child is looked at individually. Um, everybody will have a very different set of circumstances. Um, and there isn't a ceiling in terms of the amount of short breaks a family can have. What we look at is is the need. Um, we do, I, I guess, um, prioritise children in, in terms of offering services. But what might happen is that they may get a different array of services. So maybe they may access short breaks after school or at the weekend, which will just be community activities. They may access overnight provisions. Um, and sometimes they'll access T Laura. Um, and in Helen's paper, um, there was also re reference made to the caravans that actually the children have. So some children will utilize both T Laura and the caravans, for example, or sometimes parents will um, utilize the caravans which is known as our unwind project, and then the children may access T Laura or or caravans or um, our family link provision. We we can offer direct payments to families on top of that as well. So we 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 juggle the provisions in terms of priority need as best we can. But they but I guess just just to be clear, it's about recognising the need, identifying what that assessed need is, and responding to it. 
thank you. And I'm guessing all of those families know exactly what's in, entitled to them or, or is it you sort of kind of drive that conversation when and if the need arises? Well, there isn't such a, I guess, an amount in terms of what someone's entitled to. It's just in terms of we, we talk it through in terms of their needs. We talk through what a typical time would look like. But as well as the families, it's very much it's very important to us to make sure that we get the wishes and feelings of the children. Lots of children can't cope with being away from their families overnight for periods. So sometimes it has to be a mismatch that meets the needs then of the family and the child. Thank you. Sorry, and, and just to add to that, obviously there are wait in times, but they are reviewed regularly, you know, by the providers and, and, and by us to make sure that, you know, we can offer something, if not, you know, the exact provision that the, the family required at that point. So we can try and, you know, uh, ensure that there, there, there are services going into those families. Um, Michelle uh, mentioned uh, within uh, Helen's report about the caravans, obviously that was funded through um, you know, um, so, so services to be run by Action for Children. That's been, you know, that, that's quite innovative. It's been phenomenally successful. You had feedbacks and case study, uh, feedback and case studies from families saying that it's prevented family breakdown. Um, and we've also had other, um, you know, programs such as Coast, which has been through, um, you know, uh, STC prior, um, where they're not necessarily short breaks as such, but a lot of the targeted provision is often targeted at you know, ALN being one of our key priorities. Um, and that's enabled families to access um, provision, um, especially over the holidays, which is a long time. Um, and again, feedback from that has said, without that provision, they wouldn't be able to access anything mainstream because of the needs of the children and, and the lack of mainstream provision that's uh, you know, fully inclusive. So I do think we think things are inclusive because there's a, there's a, a door and, and 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 stairs and things like that, but actually to make it fully inclusive um, is is very different. So one example of that um, last summer we had a young person surfing that required four surfing instructors that we were able to fund. So yes, it's, it's so yeah, we try try to make things everything inclusive. Councillor uh, Councillor uh, Connor, you happy that you finished? Yeah, thank you. And I guess just just on off the back of that, it's only just because I'm I guess I'm thinking if a carer may need a break um, or or time away, if I mean that in the nicest way at that particular moment, I suppose they may need that now uh, as opposed to in six weeks or six months' time. So I was just sort of kind of. You know, is that available immediately also for those that may need that help or support immediately rather than scheduling in in six months time, if that also makes sense? I guess. It wouldn't be realistic to say that that's available immediately for every family. It, it's not, but we do our very best to to provide that in, in as timely way as that we, as we can do. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Lawson. Thank you. Um, yes, thanks for this report. It's it's really good. It's really, really good work that's going on. Um, I just wondered really whether there's been any discussion of this, um, of these particular issues in the context of some of our um cultural institutions so our galleries museums uh other uh service provisions that might be able to uh, provide sort of more specialist sessions or more enhanced offers for uh some of our young people to use is has that context been looked at much at all In some ways it has. So we, I, I guess children tell us in their feedback that they want to be members of their communities. They want to be able to access the same provisions as their as their siblings or their peers. Um, so we we do work with, with some local provisions, brownies, guides, um, rainbows, uh, uh, so I guess to name but a few. Also the Swansea Odium, they will run special um, programmes or sorry, special screenings for some of the children, um, I guess where there's a bit more, it's a bit more relaxed. Um, maybe the lights are on and they can get up from their seats, move around a bit off, more often, 
um, and, it, and it's known that that might happen. In terms of galleries, etc., that hasn't been something that we've explored to date, no. And so, yeah, just to add to that, we also have a contract with Interplay um, to increase access to mainstream services. So the principle of that is, again, young young people with additional needs, you know, often they, they will say they just want to hang on town or, or do things that other young people do, but they aren't able to. So the part of that contract is enabling young people to access those readily available things, um, but also to enable other provision to be more inclusive. So, uh, you know, provide training and support to make, you know, any institution, whether it's cultural or otherwise, to sort of, um, you know, increase that, um, increase that. And go back to the information and communication um, uh, question in terms of the overall provision that was highlighted as a part of this review in terms of parent carers, young people and providers aren't entirely sure exactly what is, is available. So part of, you know, one of the suggestions from the review will be to, you know, look at our communication and information and how we can better improve that so everybody's aware of, you know, different things that are happening. Okay, I think, yeah, you happy there, Councillor Lawson? Yeah, yeah, okay, great. Okay, I can't see MBS indicating, so I've got a few questions. Um, so the, the three areas, really, so one's about the residential, one's a the series about residential, a couple of others about direct payments, and then also about the review itself. So, to, in terms of the um, residential, I'm just wondering what what what's what 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 are we commissioning there? What's the kind of number of beds available? Are we the only commissioners of that service, or are we commissioning block? Are we? In, does that you've you've mentioned that might might not be meeting our demand already? I think in the report, but in terms of what does that look like in terms of how that's commissioned? Um, because I, I know that I know lit, I've heard a little bit about short breaks in the past um, through my day job in terms of the challenges of meeting. Well, number one, that moving away from residentials maybe to more to more flexible arrangements like you've already discussed, direct payments, but also the challenges of matching in 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 residentials when you've got such a range of needs of new in terms of the children and young people that you're working with. So some some questions around that. So how do we commission that? What does that look like? Does it meet our demand, etc.? And are we happy that it's value for money? I guess that's part of what you're doing in the review. So we'll perhaps start with those questions. Okay. So if I talk on behalf of the residential T Laura, um, T Laura is a four bedded unit. Um, and we we aim to have four children there for six nights of the week. Um, at the moment, we have a quorum of 35 children accessing that provision. Um, we work very, very closely with T Laura. Um, recently, they've supported us with some emergency placements for two children that were already accessing their provision, which meant that those children could go to a familiar setting whilst we identified a longer term solution for them. Um, as well as the um, overnight provision, they do provide daycare provision in the school summer holidays, and they will have um, up to between six and eight children, depending on needs. So those days are very, very much matched around, maybe one day will be around children with physical disabilities, one child, one day, um, maybe there'll be a, a cohort of children with learning disabilities, and then maybe another day of neurodiverse children, et cetera. So, so they, we do match in, in that way. Um, I guess the same is the same will be said for overnight provision in terms of matching. Um, and there has been a couple of times where we've had to be really creative and ask staff to take a couple of children out to enable a child to, to, to stay overnight because it's been an essential, like an emergency situation. A parent's gone into hospital or something and that child has really needed that provision that night. So they've been really flexible and um, they work really, really well with us. Um, just pick up the phone and we'll, we'll find a solution together. It, it's, it's great, works really, really well. And just to add to Michelle's point there, in terms of the commissioning arrangements, we currently have a uh, contract in place for T, Laura and the Family Link uh, until the 31st of uh, December 2024. Uh, we are currently undergoing, so the review that, that uh, was mentioned in the report 
is the sort of holistic a and n disability review um and then we have sort of commissioning um reviews as well so we will be undertaking that shortly specifically for those two contracts um with a, a review no a review to kind of work up um, an options appraisal um and then sort of exactly what you said there in terms of looking at the data is it fit for purpose because obviously you know needs and, and and demographics change over the years of a contract so just you know it, it might still be absolutely perfect and then you know you just recommission but you know there is you know different dynamics and, and and data and information to look into before you kind of make those decisions then so obviously we prepare the information and then it'll be down to senior officers etc to uh to decide on the best way forward we will look at all the possible data available in order to ensure that it meets you know uh, emerging needs I know you always, you, I think a couple of you have already mentioned that part of that will be obviously um, consultation or co-production with with your service users as well. And it won't just be about raw data; it'll be about people's experiences on the ground. Of course, um, the other questions then were about um, direct payments, um, and I might be wrong about this, so just tell me that. But my understanding with direct payments is that obviously it's a, it's a, it allows um, service users and their families to make decisions about what's how to use that, and they, and they can use that how. In terms of who provides the support is what I'm, what I'm getting at. They can decide that. And obviously lots of families and parents will be completely capable of doing that, but there will be some that might struggle to decide, you know, quality of providers, what's best, who how to do how to go about doing that. So I just wondered what what our what kind of role is within that, supporting parents to make those decisions if they find those decisions hard to make themselves. So families have flexibility to use direct payments in line with their assessed needs and in line with the child's care and support plan. And that's really important, I think, just to make that clear. So it isn't about, oh, I think I'll just go and buy this or I'll go and buy that. It has to be purposeful for the young person and evidencing that it's going to have a positive outcome. Um, most families can manage direct payments themselves, but there is an option of having a managed account for families but I guess where the finances, et cetera, are, are undertaken. Um, and then they would could, they can work with their social worker to work out how, or their support worker, how many um, hours, et cetera, um, a support worker works through the week. Often that's a repeat, say Tuesday, uh, five to 10 or whatever. And then, and then they will make sure that payroll is informed of that. So PA is, um, is paid. And then there are care and uh, reviews of the child's care and support plan um, and within that the 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 direct payment package or any package that the child is receiving is is reviewed and talked about and, and worked through and so just to add to that as well in terms of direct payments in general we are looking at how we can innovatively utilize that uh going forward so you know we're looking at maybe pooling resource you no know, pooling direct payments so you know, um, looking at sort of groups of parents to sort of pool that resource and and you know enable other things to happen, um, and we are looking at whether we can do an event to exactly that really. Um, you know, often we kind of look at you know personal assistance and things like that for direct payments, which is fab. But there's so many other things out there now, um, holistically that we know works really well for children, and young people. Um, you know, that would be completely alien few years ago. So, um, you know, potentially bring all those ideas together. So it is a choice, but it's an informed choice because you might not necessarily know what the different, like what Buddies is or Pops is, or, you know, that you could utilize it for surfability. So it is about us enabling families to have the, you know, the, be the widest range of opportunities that they can really. So that is an event hopefully we're working up, um, you know, in the near future. I guess it's all about voice choice and control really and that's what's driving this review um in terms of people if people think that um a pa would be good for them and their family then we do have within adult services the direct payment support team and they will help um parents where it's not a relative that's going to um, provide that sort of pa type support they'll help them with advertising or getting cvs out to them and the social work team can help them look at whether who's suitable and who's not because that between them they know the child's needs really well um, but i think the core drive from child and family services is about that voice choice and control so there are so many different options of families um, and it's about with the expertise of the social work team and the commissioning team is enabling families to be aware of what's out there for them and their family 
Um, and we know that in all likelihood, we're probably never going to have enough of what Tealora can offer, but we're trying to introduce other ways to make a similar offer by being creative and flexible. Really, and caravans is a really good idea because that can one put families in control of when, but also if it's not the families that care for the child, then we have the expertise, the registered staff from Tealora to do that. So we, we're trying really, really as hard as we can within the resources we've got available to uh, create as big an offer as we possibly can, really. OK, thank you. And just to bring the item to a close, I can't say anything else indicating. In terms of time scales, I know Mark, you mentioned for two two, uh, two parts of the Commission review will September next this year, you said, 20, 2024, you said? The uh, current, the, the, the two contracts are up on 31st of December, so we shall you know, commence the uh, Commission review now, and then, you know, it'll hopefully it'll be in place then on the 1st of January 2025. Yeah, Chair, I was just going to suggest perhaps if um, at a later stage when the review is completed, we could bring something back to the committee just to keep everyone's awareness. Yeah. Yeah, I think that would be really appropriate, Louise. Thank you. I'm oh, sorry. John, should I just make a, just a comment in, um, regarding the short break and you're offering families to remain together? Is that the situation where um, is it the stress and the strain of looking after somebody who may be severely um, disabled or? Uh, or, or suffering from some from mental disability. I mean, the concept of, of, of putting children uh, and, and giving them a break is, is fine, but it also gives the families themselves a break. I'm wondering, is that sort of taken into consideration when you take people away? Because it's a bit of respite for the parents or, or the carers of those children, because looking after, I mean, looking after normal children is, is, is a hard task, but if you because somebody who sort of needs sort of 24 hour care. I mean, uh, the, the family, the parents, especially other carers, those children really deserve that break as well as uh, as the children themselves. So it's just just um, just just a thought. I mean, you take that into sort of consideration when you when when you when you when you put somebody into a, a, a giving him giving those children a break. So we're child and family services, so we're very much aware of supporting the child, supporting the family, brings them all up together. So it, it's making sure that the provision is right for the child and right for the family. We wouldn't be sending a child off if they really didn't want to go. We'd think of an alternative, if we could, that would kind of meet meet everybody's needs. And the other thing just to add is that um, the, the carers, the parents have a right to an assessment. Uh, and the way that we approach that is we have an active offer of that and the, and the parents or carers can have that as a family assessment or they can have a separate assessment to that which we do for their child. So we, we, we make sure that we make that offer and sometimes families aren't ready for that assessment of themselves as carers, but we don't forget that and we always go back and just check in with them because you're absolutely right that their, their respite and their break to recharge their batteries is, is really, really important. When I'm reading the, the stories about funds, that's the one thing that really, really helps them as parents and carers um, to, to sort of be themselves for a while and, and just have that time out, really. It's really important. Thank you. OK, thanks. I really appreciate the reports. Really interesting, important work, and I appreciate the on the answers as well. It's really refreshing, so thanks for coming. Appreciate that. OK. Um, on to item five on the agenda then, please, uh, which is ta the Tackling Poverty Strategy, which is the presentation and. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if, you're happy, happy. Yeah. if you're happy, I'll share my screen to yeah. um, share the presentation. And there it is. Fantastic. Thank you. So, uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, uh, afternoon, everyone. For those who don't know me, my name is Lee Cambouli. I'm the uh, Principal Officer for Tackling Poverty. Um, and just want to kind of take this opportunity to provide a bit of a progress update on our refresh of the Council's Tackling Poverty Strategy. So, um, as you may know, the last time we uh, published the strategic direction for tackling poverty was in 2017. Uh, and a lot has happened since then, not least the cost of living crisis, which continues to have a massive impact on our society. We started revisiting this strategic direction in detail last year but uh, and we will soon be going uh, out to public consultation with our proposals but until then um this is just a preview of some of the key findings from the work we've undertaken to date um so happy to go through this uh slide so uh just the first um set a bit of the the context really um so 
Um, this is very much a refresh, as I said, of the, the strategy we published in 2017, uh, with a longer term ambition to address the causes and effects of poverty on the people and communities of Swansea. We recognise it throughout this process. Um, one of the things that is, is key to this is the com poverty is a, a complex global challenge that's currently affecting all of society. So we're trying to incorporate that in, in what we're saying going forward. Uh, therefore, our approach to uh, looking at the strategic path that's ahead of us, um, we're taking in three distinct drivers. The big picture, the sort of global, national and regional priorities and approaches. Um, what is the local ambition in terms of our vision for Swansea, which encapsulates poverty? Um, and what is the personal perspective of the people who have lived experience of poverty? Um, uh, for that last point, we conducted a survey last year um, with uh, residents and, and colleagues, partners, stakeholders uh, to understand a bit more about what poverty means to people and what are the most significant issues in in impacting them. Um, we ran the survey between mid-August and the end of September. Uh, we received over 300 responses to the survey and thousands of comments and quotes and uh, you know lots lots of insight from people who've experienced poverty. Um, our team held two public drop-in sessions uh, at our Opportunities Hub in the Quadrant, uh, and we spoke directly to many people and organisations about their views on poverty. So the next slide is just to kind of share with you some of the um, comments that we pulled out of that research. I, I won't kind of um, go through them all in, in detail. You can read them there, but... Um, just to kind of sum up, basically, the um, uh, sort of the key areas that uh, we, we kind of discovered and we went into more depth uh, within the survey. So uh, I think, you know, just to reflect the certainly the, the first and last comments to me, um, you know, are poignant reminders of the, the stark reality that we're facing. Um, but the things that we did ask in the survey, um, we, we talked about uh, our definition of poverty. And many of the responses we had indicated that the current definition, which references the minimum income standard, um, needed more clarity and to be easier to understand, um, as well as recognising some of the broader impacts. I, as, as one quote said, it's not just about struggling financially, you know, all of the, the impacts such as on well-being and so on. Um, we, we explored the impacts of poverty. Uh, as in what do people actually see as the biggest impacts that poverty has on their lives. 49% uh, of the respondents identified that um, help with fuel and energy costs, uh, including travel, was the biggest impact in Swansea. Uh, that was closely followed by finances at 40% and the emotional and relationship impacts at 37%. So these were kind of the top three sort of uh, areas that our survey found were, were what people said these are the biggest impacts. Um, we also explored through the survey actions that could be taken to tackle poverty. We listed a wide range of ideas, some of which we are doing now uh, and others which that we, we could be doing in the future. Um, and we asked for people's ideas about what they thought were the most uh, important actions to take. Uh, the top three ideas we had from the survey were improving access to affordable, safe and secure homes, which was 97% of respondents said that was the top priority, as well as tackle and prevent homelessness, uh, and improving access to services, including referrals, signposting, and awareness of what support is available to people, um, which was rated as uh, agreed by 96% of respondents. So very high sort of responses on these sort of the big things that we should be doing. So the surveys has given us lots of great evidence to, to align with our big picture and local priority analysis. Um, we've used the voice of real people to inform the development of the strategy. So these quotes, uh, they're on the screen, that they, they just make it clear what people are thinking and the, it's just the first step towards better co-production of our strategic approach. Um, we're already taking that further as well in terms of engaging with the Swansea Poverty Truth Commission uh, as a great place to start in terms of getting lived experience embedded across all of this work going forward. Um, just to kind of take it to the next st stage and, and look at some of the emerging um, priorities that came out of that. So when we were capturing all of this information, we wanted to kind of blend together the the research, the insights, the analysis we had from sort of national, regional and local levels. Um, and blended all of the emerging trends. So these were um, the seven key priorities that the drafting of the strategy has shown us. They're in no particular order, but just to give you a bit of a flavour of them. So um, digital inclusion um, means that making it easier, safer and more equitable to uh, use digital technologies and services that benefit everyone. Um, and this is part of a societal move anyway. You know, it, 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 we can't exclude parts of the population because they're disadvantaged by, say, not having the money to afford the right equipment or access to the Internet. 
Um, so and as well as improving skills and confidence uh, of people to use digital. Um, so a, a big part of this priority is going to be about removing the barriers to get people online and benefit from accessing quality services and support. Um, community support uh, means helping the local communities to become resilient and self-reliant in the face of major challenges such as poverty. Uh, we learned through the pandemic um, about the strength of local people helping local people, but there are many challenges still within the community environment that um, and by community we're talking a geographical community or a community of people with characteristics or, or shared interests, etc. So basically the 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 how can we help uh, communities to be the best place to respond to a crisis uh, or crises such as uh, poverty information advice and guidance that that was uh, a big issue we had lots of comments in the survey suggesting that more advice services and direct support on areas like benefit entitlements is needed um inequality of opportunity is also referenced uh, through this work uh, as a reason why people struggle to access the information that's already out there so it's not just digital inclusion it's uh, overcoming some of those barriers and, and that's one thing we can look at uh stigma and discrimination yeah another loud message we heard from the survey uh, one of the comments i noted um uh, i feel i cannot admit my struggles whether that's from pride or shame or maybe both but i know i need help so it's those sort of uh, when people are saying that it's it's very clear there's a different sort of stigma associated with poverty and if people don't feel they can talk about their struggles they're not you know how can we identify and help them yeah so um yeah this big area of concern for me and i think lots we can do in this space uh child poverty um as you will know if you've uh, anyone's read the updated welsh government strategy that was published a month ago this is a national area of focus um there are already five sort of national priorities identified for this work. Um, but uh, locally, we heard lots of comments uh, from people and, and, and parents particularly. Uh, another comment I pulled out, um, my child can't have a pair of shoes he needs for school because the meals for the day need to be met. So, you know, we, we're talking about uh, parents and families being in this really difficult uh, decision of having to make these, these choices. And homelessness uh, has already been mentioned as one of the key priority areas for action. Uh, it aligns with the national focus for the housing support grant, for example. Lots already been done in this area, but obviously these are areas where we can work co-productively with people who have, you know, been homeless, lived experience of homelessness to improve the support and help that's available. And then uh, finally on their health and well-being, I think that that's a key one, the a final priority. Lots of evidence and research linking poverty with physical and mental health. So lots we can do in this area as well. Um, and lots that we can do to link in um, poverty with, for instance, the consequences of ill long long term ill health. So that was a real whistle stop to end. There's lots of comments that we've aligned to this work. There's lots of analysis that supports it. Um, uh, but these are just our uh, priorities as a starting point to carry on working forward. Um, and we want to get more people with lived experience of these things involved in defining and shaping them as we move forward. OK, final slide from each and then um, happy to take a breath. Um, yeah, so just kind of the way forward then in terms of the next steps. And, it's, uh, you know, as I said, we were um, uh, you know, coming today to give you a bit of a, an overview, there is a lot to digest even in that, but the strategy itself will spell all of this out in more detail. So I just want to give some reassurance about what's going to happen next. Um, one of the key principles right up front about this is that we want to recognise that tackling poverty is not the sole responsibility of the council. Uh, and in fact, even if it was, we, we couldn't do it alone. Um, so we are right in this strategy to invoke that commitment to a collaborative approach um, where tackling poverty is everyone's business. Um, we work with our partners and stakeholders to ensure that this strategy underpins that sort of unified approach uh, to take, be taken forward in Swansea. Um, one of the issues that um, well, we're trying to define an approach to, swap, to poverty um, is that it is so complex. Therefore, we need to be thinking about the way we're presenting this information. So what we're going to do is we're, we're, going, we're aiming to publish this uh, strategy in three different editions. Um, uh, a detailed edition that's going to have all the analysis uh, and the information that our partners and service providers can access and see all of the workings out, if you like, um, that they can use to reference it for, you know, bidding for money and so on. Um, we'll also do a summary edition, which will have like a bird's eye view of the plans and actions that we're going to take forward. Um, something not too analytical, but it gives us a clear direction. And then we'll produce an easy read version as well to present the strategy clearly and in a format that's easy to understand. Um, within the detail of the strategy, uh, I think it's worth mentioning, we'll be clearly articulating 
what poverty means in different ways. I think one of the things about people understanding what it means has, has come through really clearly. So we're talking about poverty in terms of the journey, in terms of the characteristics of poverty, um, the different approaches and pathways, etc. So this will help us to clearly set some expectations about uh, what poverty is and how we can measure the effects uh, of our efforts to tackle it. Uh, as I mentioned, the refresh will start more engagement and collaborative work in as well with people, particularly with people with lived experience. Um, and in line with our new corporate policy on co-production, we'll be um, putting in place some mechanisms to help us uh, get more people involved in shaping the strategy, the action plans that come out of it, uh, and all of the plans and services. And then finally, just in terms of next steps, so as I mentioned, we've, we've, within the Tackling Poverty Service, we're aligning our resources to deliver this, and we've been going through some uh, restructuring within the, the service. So after that, my team will be finalising and sharing uh, the draft uh, edition of this strategy. Um, we'll then go for public consultation, and uh, it'll be it's still a key priority for my area. Um, so we'll be able to kind of look at that as part of the restructure and deliver a clearer timescale um, to communicate by the end of March so that people know the timescales of uh, the next steps. Um, it's my hope the next time I come to the committee, we'll be bringing the strategy for consideration and comment. But for, for right now, we're just kind of making that plan and putting those arrangements in place. Um, and that's it for, for me, um, but I'm very happy to answer any questions uh, that anyone may have. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, good. Uh, thanks for that. Uh, anybody with any questions or comments for Lee on that? Uh, yeah. Uh, Les, if you'd like to come in, please. Yeah, thanks, Chair. A um, couple of things. One thing that I'm very grateful that you've not used the two words you might pet hate, which are rich and poor. I'm glad you've said all of what you've said using the word poverty, because I think it's also, I, I don't know whether you did have any comments on this, but I think it's also language that creates the stigma and the words rich and poor are the worst two words to use to reflect on people who are in poverty. Because the idea that somebody's rich is only to do with money or poor is only to do with money, it's ridiculous. So I'm very pleased you've avoided them. Whether you've done that on purpose or not, I don't know, but I'm pleased about that. The, the other one I did want to comment on is this good old horny digital inclusion. And I, uh, as it happens, I've been uh, on a working, scrutiny working group quite recently on this. And I think we've again raised the point that yes, we must do as much as possible to include people uh, to make sure they have got access to computers to be able to do stuff online. But we've also always got to acknowledge that there are some people who never will, either because they can't or they won't access a computer. So we've also always got to make sure we've got things in place to um, also cater for those people. But, uh, but um, thanks, Lee, for the presentation. Thanks very much. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah, just quickly back on, on first point. Yeah, absolutely. We, we had a very specific comment about language that we, we've kind of taken on board. So really important that things like rich and poor are part of changing the narrative to, in terms of where we're moving to. So, yeah, we, we, we kind of have already picked up on that. Um, and then, yeah, absolutely agree with your second point. I, I, I think um, that's the direction we're headed in. I think we've um, we know digital inclusion is is one of those areas that it's it's not just putting more training on or giving people access to get iPads and things like that. There's a culture change and there's, there's a bit of a shift that needs to go on as well within our services and provisions and so on to make it much more of an, an equitable way of uh, supporting people. So yeah, absolutely. These are all factors that will be fed into the development of the action plans that come out with the strategy. So thank you very much for that. Thanks, Les. Anyone else? Uh, Alan? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Just, um, just a couple of things. You mentioned the fact that um, that it's not the council's responsibility to uh, to address um, to address poverty, but I do feel that um, the council, in some way, should take uh, some kind of leading role in there, in sort of uh, helping to provide those volunteers who are who are willing to take on um, and support. Uh, those who do struggle in, in, in life for various reasons, uh, poverty being one of them, um, because I feel that there should be places in and around the, the city, call them drop-in centres, if you like, where um, 
but it's not quite quite so formal uh, that that uh, sort of puts off these uh, people from from attending. But something that's quite informal, where they could just have a meal of an evening or to play play pool or cards or something of that nature, somewhere where they can go and and and, and open up and express their their concerns. And at the same time, you could be uh, either directly or indirectly then offering guidance and support to try and put them back on, onto the straight road. But coming back to the council, I do feel that they, we should be putting some some effort and some direction and, and leading in, in that way. You. Yeah, if I can come back on that, Councillor. Yeah, totally agree. I think um, certainly not to suggest that it's the sole responsibility of the council, but definitely there is a, a huge role for us to play. Um, and I think we want to work with our partners and our colleagues ac across different sectors, different organisations to drive that forward. And I think the refresh of the strategy is definitely the first part of that. And uh, yeah, just your second point as well. Um, absolutely. And, and that's what a lot of our services are focused on, that preventative element where we're, we're doing that initial work within communities. You know, we're, we're, we're kind of um, through local area coordination, through, uh, you know, our work, uh, you know, through community uh, hubs and, and groups and supporting communities to become more self-reliant. Self and resilient all of that is about absolutely giving people those places to go to start those conversations to work on some of those things and help with that sort of um uh, avoiding people's needs from escalating so yeah i think it's it's all linked in with the strategy everything you've said there thank you okay uh, anybody else would like to come in at this point on the strategy no, okay. Um, just a couple of things. I've only got a couple of things. I think I said a lot in, when you came and um, presented in, in July, and obviously this is an, an update, and we look forward to seeing what happens next. Um, in terms of um, the digital inclusion, I mean, you know, absolutely fundamentally agree it's a real challenge. I mean, somebody was getting closer to 50 than 40 these days and is not, not necessarily the most technologically natural person in the world. I miss the 90s. Um, uh, it's really important. I totally see that, but I... One of the things that does sometimes I I think is important to remind people is is it's about community inclusion as well, isn't it? Is that people need to be included in their communities, and I think digital inclusion is part of that, not necessarily the prime part. If you, if you know what I mean, I think I think it's secondary to community inclusion, but part of it, if you know what I mean. Um, but obviously, it's very important. But I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. What we want is people to be, you know, included in their in their communities and confident and able to get what they need in their communities, which is obviously part of what prevention is all about, isn't it? Um, and on the language thing, which um, Les obviously talked about on that point, I wasn't quite sure what um, the, the term you used around, it wasn't poverty around the journey, was it? It was something to do with the journey. So I just wanted a little, I, I kind of understood what you meant, but just a little bit of clarity on what the journey reference was in, within that, if you don't mind. Yes, of course. And, and actually, that's a really important distinction that we will be um, pulling out more in the strategy when we pull it forward. So, yeah, um, I think one of the things that um, comes through in some of the comments is that people don't know where to start. Um, poverty being sort of like a multi-generational issue or a, a short term issue, it's, it's very difficult for people to understand the uh, steps they've got to go through to escape poverty or, or whatever even escaping or um, mitigating poverty is possible. I mean, uh, a lot of the national policies talk about eradicating poverty, but for people on the ground floor, it's about how do I get to that point, that level, if you like, that I am living a, a healthy, happy, sustainable life. So um, one of the things we've done is kind of try to describe it in terms of a journey, in terms of people being able to see where, where do I start on that? Is it something I was born into? Is it something that has happened because of a circumstance in my life? And then to know what the sort of steps are to kind of help people address that and get to a point where they can say, I've escaped poverty. So to put it into those contexts and to help people understand it in a sort of a, a staged approach will, will just help us to help people. That's not to say that every person who starts that journey will escape poverty or a time scale for escaping poverty, but it gives us the way to kind of structure our services and support and help people in the right way so it becomes a bit clearer when you see it in the strategy but but certainly the journey is our way of, of trying to uh, focus our energies and say we're going to understand where people start what is the best support to give them at that point and then how does that support change as their journey progresses you know someone for instance um who may get over their financial challenges in the short term because we give them advice on access to benefits or uh, financial inclusion but then longer term maybe dealing with the emotional impacts 
of poverty. So the support changes as the journey goes goes forward. So by putting it into those contexts, that's what we're trying to do is just um, help us deliver better services and support. Yeah, it helps, helps people to realise that everybody's unique and everybody's journey, everybody's journey is unique and stig it can be destigmatising de in that way as well, can I? Yeah. That's really important. Thanks for that clarification. And then just the last thing I wanted to ask, which is something I'm compelled to ask as chair on every item that comes, um, timeline. Yes, of course. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, as I said, we're just um, getting through this difficult period with uh, uh, restructuring our services and trying to align our priorities for next year and, and uh, develop our service plans. So, yeah, certainly by the um, uh, next month, next month is March now, isn't it? Um, that's happened quick. Um, yes, we'll be coming back with uh, a timescale for the public consultation, uh, given a, a fair amount of time for us to do engagement work around that and work with communities to to explore some of that. And then we'll be able to then take that those comments and responses to the consultation uh, and turn that into the timescale for uh, publishing. Um, so yeah, at, at this rate, that's that's in we, we're in the sort of the months ahead sort of thing. But I can bring back a more detailed timescale once I've got those resources in place. Thanks, Lee. Um, okay, uh, Councillor O'Connor, then I bring Councillor Walton back in after that. Uh, so, uh, Councillor Walton, do you want to go first? Perhaps Councillor O'Connor's going to answer the door or something. Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to follow on from um, Councillor Jeffrey's point that uh, I think um, having informal hubs, as it were, is something that we need to make sure we work very closely with other agencies, because there are certainly quite a few hubs of, of various sorts already across Swansea. So obviously we want to complement, not duplicate, because obviously we want to make sure that we get the best results out of having those informal settings. So it's definitely something we need to make sure we work with external agencies as well as providing them ourselves. Thank you. Um, yes, totally agree. I, th I think you're right, Councillor. That's um, an opportunity for us to work with our partners and stakeholders and colleagues to look at um, where the need is the greatest, where there are opportunities for communities to play a role in that in terms of supporting with their assets and um, you know uh, the groups and the the people with those interests can be part of that uh, arrangement as well so yeah and then I, I think that's definitely part of our plan in in terms of how we can take this forward more sustainably okay uh, Councillor O'Connor sorry about that my phone is completely frozen so I've just transferred <laughs> device um, no, I think it's just worth mentioning uh, what Councillor Walton said. I agree about the stigma attached to certain language use as well. It's great to hear about community inclusion that you spoke about. Um, and I know that there was a local area coordinating roles that obviously I think are really good and really important because they identify the vulnerable. Are those roles safe then in the strategy going forward? I'm just wondering. Uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the local area coordination team fall under my service and they've been a, a really important part of that preventative uh, approach to, to this. So being able to identify, build those relationships within communities. So, yeah, we definitely um, are looking to maintain that sort of service uh, going forward. How that looks in terms of um, aligning it to this model going forward, the strategy will help us to shape. So as it tells us about where our priority should be and where our areas of focus should be, we'll look to see how local area coordination can be part of that. Um, but yeah, this is definitely part of uh, conversations that we've been having in terms of trying to maintain that um, success, if you like, the local area coordination has been delivering for the last few years. And particularly as we've been at full county coverage, we're very much aware we don't want to kind of lose that um, effect that we've had and the, the the value that they've brought to to all communities in Swansea. So. Yeah, I think we'll have more about the the future of local area coordination. The um, the model that we want going forward, we'll be doing a lot more consultation work on that in the in the months ahead. Thank you. Okay, that's great. Um, I can't see anybody else indicating. So uh, just thanks very much, Lee, for coming and giving us giving us an update, and Amy for coming along too. And yourself, Louise, for coming along and giving us an update. Look forward to seeing what um the progress and you coming back to us in a, in a couple in a couple in a few months with an update on that as well. Thanks very much for your attendance today. Okay, um, last item on the agenda then, this is just about just the work plan going forward. So on the back of your agenda, um, you'll see that the next meeting is the 8th of April. And we'll be having input from um, Jane Whitmore and Mark Gosney on the overview of enabling communities grant, um, which is, um, and then 
done at all, isn't it, for that for, for that for that month? So, um, if there hasn't any other questions or any other comments, thanks to all of the committee for their attendance. Thanks to all the officers for your work and your support. Thanks to Alison and Democratic Services and to Legal as well for their ongoing support. Um, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.